Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to session five. Um, we're going to begin today with um, Professor Luis Martinez Victorio. Um, he's an English and North American literature professor. He's been coordinator of the PhD program in literary and cultural studies of the Engl of English speaking countries, organized by the English Department of the Complutense. Since joining the English Department, both his teaching and research have focused on the fin de siècle and modernist movement. And among his publications in this field are his critical editions of Oscar Wilde's essays, The Decay of Lying and The Critic as Artist, a critical edition of Walter Pater's Style, and his articles, La Postmodernidad de T.S. Eliot, Oscar Wilde o la Literatura como Excedente Subversivo, the Decadent Wells, Science Fiction as a Product of the Fin de Siècle, Nar Narciso y Dioniso and Walter Pater y Oscar Wilde, and Decaden Decadentismo y Misoginia, vis eh, Visiones Míticas de la Mujer en el Fin de Siglo. And the Complutense also, um, in 1990, published his doctoral thesis, Relaciones Irónicas en la Obra Narrativa y Dramática de Oscar Wilde. And his most recent publications are the article De Sino y Trauma en La Ciudad de Cristal de Paul Auster, the essay La Poesía según John Stuart Mill, which includes the translation of Mill's writings on poetry, and the novel in sonnets Retrato de Don Juan Mirando al Mar. Okay. Oh, thank you. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Well, I'm going to talk about William Carlos Williams. The title of my talk is Objectivism and Objectification in the, Be and the Beauty of the Non-Entity. William Carlos Williams was an objectivist poet, and many passages from his poetics reflect his aesthetic orientation. Among these passages, there are three that in particular has been, have been inspiring for the topic that I'm going to discuss today. The, the first passage is that in which he says that the poem is a machine made out of words. Yeah? The poem is identified as a structure characterized by accuracy, lack of superfluous elements, and efficiency. The second passage is that in which he says that the work of art must not be realist, but the work of art must be reality itself. So for a poem so focused on reality, Laquillians, the objective is not the mimesis of reality, but the generation of reality through that new entity, which is the objectivist point, to be incorporated to pre-existing reality. The third passage is that in which he says that objectivism implies looking at the poem with a special eye to the structure of the poem, to how the poem has been constructed. This is something that affects both the author and the reader and tells us something about Williams's concept of the reading process as a kind of halfway encounter between the reader and the author, or to use Gadamer's terminology as a merger of horizons, the horizon of the author and the horizon of the reader. So William Carlos Williams was an objectivist poet, but it's also true that an element of objectification appears in some of his poems, and objectification and objectivism are not the same thing. Often, this results in a tension between objectivism and objectification. In the second part of my, of my talk, I'm going to discuss very briefly three poems. Two poems, Entitled, uh, the poem, one poem entitled Apology, the other Pastoral, which in my opinion are good examples of this tension between objectivism and objectification. And then I'm going to refer to the, uh, the, the famous Red Wheelbarrow as a perfect, perfect example of objectivism without any tension with objectification. Objectification, in the sense in which I use the word here, is a consequence of our approach to other human beings. We objectify other human beings because of the way we speak to them, because of the way we speak about them, or because of the way we treat them in general. And this is why objectification appears in those poems in which Williams deals with those people he calls non-entities. Non-entities is an expression that appears in his poem Apology. 
That is, objectification appears when he deals with the social non-entities, the poor, the poor working class, the marginalized, people for whom, paradoxically, because of this element of objectification, for whom he felt and manifested radical sympathies. In order to contextualize the political implications of this dialectic between objectivism and objectification, I'm going to cite the essay by Milton A. Cohen, beleaguered poets and leftist critics, Stevens, Cummings, Frost, and Williams in the 1930s. Cohen argues that Williams was a genuinely proletarian writer whose experience with working class and the poor came not from the theoretical doctrine, but from his daily rounds as a doctor, which brought him into continual contact with their struggles to survive the Depression, as well as with their speech and personalities. In this essay, the chapter devoted to William Carlos Williams is entitled William Carlos Williams, Colon, Proletarian versus Marxist. And what Cohen argues is that Williams was fundamentally a proletarian poet precisely because of the origin of his sympathies. That these sympathies didn't come from theoretical doctrines learned in political treaties, he is supposed to be just a proletarian poet. My opinion is that in the context of this dichotomy proletarian versus Marxist, perhaps from an aesthetic perspective, with political implication, but from an aesthetic perspective, he could be also considered as a Marxist, as a Marxist poet, if we take into account his experimental elements, and we relate these experimental elements with the aesthetic principles of the German and Marxist critic Walter Benjamin, whose ideas are expressed fundamentally in his essay, The Work of Art in the Age of Mechanical Reproduction. So, I want to clarify this. I'm not saying that William was a Marxist. I'm not saying that he believed in the possibility of realization of a communist utopia or something like that. I am simply dealing with this dichotomy, proletarian versus Marxist, anything that from an aesthetic point of view, with political implications, he can be seen as a Marxist. And of course, I take into account as a context, William says, progressive and leftist orientation in political terms. My thesis is that Williams is a proletarian poet, or just a proletarian poet, when he doesn't comply fully with the principles of his objectivist poetics. That is, when he expresses his sympathies for the social non-entities without that formal creativity which, according to Williams himself, defines an objectivist approach to poetry. In these cases, the result is the objectification of the social non-entity, and sometimes this is something that can be seen as aestheticizing the poor or aestheticizing poverty. Williams made very clear the importance of the structure in an objectivist poem, but to have a special eye to the structure of the poem implies that the structure becomes visible enough because of its originality and because of the defamiliarization that that originality provokes. The mere expression of sympathy is not enough. A commitment to action is necessary. In his personal life, Williams took part in many actions in favor of the poor, in favor of the marginalized, promoted by leftist organizations. But of course, that commitment to action is also necessary in poetry, if the poet is interested in expressing his sympathies for the social non-entities. An action Action in poetical terms for an objectivist poet, according to Williams's principles, implies formal experimentation. That experimentation that makes the structure of the poem as meaningful as the words included in it. As I have said, Williams can be seen as a Marxist poet, not just a proletarian, in relation to the aesthetic theories of Walter Benjamin who, in his work of art essay, stated the principles of the correct approach to art from a Marxist perspective. For Benjamin, realism had been commandeered by the bourgeoisie to such an extent 
that it's when it was no longer useful for the critical awakening of the reader or the spectator that he considered to be a necessary effect of any artistic or literary manifestation. Engels and Gil Lukács had championed realism as the most appropriate approach to, uh, to literature from a Marxist perspective. Frederick Jameson, Frederick Jameson, and the case later, was going to defend or to propose the magical narratives as an alternative to realism. Magical narratives under the influence of Ernst Bloch's principle of hope. Mm -hmm. Benjamin was going to choose something that could be relatively, only relatively, associated with modernist poetics. This is something that I underline, relatively. What he proposed was an aesthetic of participation, an aesthetic of the fragment, an aesthetic of intermittent attention, and an aesthetic that in any way was there to challenge the reader or the spectator, and I am, I am dealing with the average reader and the average spectator, okay? Uh, which challenges the reader and the spectator in a way that makes him or her perceive the mode of production behind the literary piece. According to Benjamin, the aura of the work of art, Elaura, the aura of the work of art, which is equivalent to the commodification of any other product in the context of a capitalist economy, the aura of the work of art should be seriously undermined by the perception of the mode of production. That is, by the perception of how the poem has been constructed. That is, by the perception of the structure. And so the structure must be innovative in order to encourage the participation of the reader or the spectator. According to Benjamin, to be seduced, to be seduced by the aura of the work of art implies experiencing the work of art as a commodity, ideologically as a commodity, implies seeing the value of the work of art as something intrinsic to that work of art, and this favors a passive attitude in relation to the work of art, a passive reception of the work of art, sometimes a rapture of contemplation of the work of art, things or attitudes which neutralize a critical disposition. So, as far as poetry is concerned, only a structural creativity can encourage the critical awakening of the reader, necessary to perceive the social, the, the social non-entity without banalizing that social non-entity, without objectifying that social non-entity. The interesting thing about this critical awakening, according to Walter Benjamin, is that it, it, it does not require an absolute consciousness on the part of the reader. Benjamin considers that most of the time, we can become critics in a state of distraction. Hmm. And the state of distraction probably is normally a state of the modern man and the modern woman in the context of, well, in the age of mechanical reproduction, let alone in the age of digital reproduction. Hmm. <laughs> so for Benjamin, for Benjamin, distraction is not something negative. Distraction is the breeding ground for the shock of revelation. To remain soul, falling on the horse, hmm? mm -hmm. soul of the revelation, mm -hmm. he was distracted, <laughs> for sure. So, distraction is the breathing ground, breathing ground for the shock of revelation. A revelation which is aesthetic, as it happens in relation or in the interaction with the work of art, but also with political implications, because because of the critical awakening. The critical awakening is supposed to transform the individual who in turn is supposed to transform society. For Benjamin, a paradigmatic example of this critical awakening in a state of distraction happens in a relationship with the camera when we are spectators of a film. We are distracted. We go to the movies for entertainment. We are distracted, but we are following the camera's eye. We are inserted in that perspective, with all its intentional and unintentional biases. 
and to some extent unconsciously we can begin we can begin to realize that perhaps our own perspective is not truth hmm. and this is the basis for the critical awakening according to benjamin's theories well here i am in one way or another remembering remembering engel's definition of ideology as the belief that perspective is truth Hmm? Ideology is the belief that perspective is truth, particularly when that perspective is dominant, that is, when that perspective is the dominant ideology in any society. Well, now the relation with Williams. I think that the apparent simplicity of most points written by Williams, that brief and cute thing that almost everybody can understand and enjoy, with different but normally accessible degrees of experimentation is particularly useful for this kind of revelation. Of course, that simplicity and cuteness can favor initially the aura of the poem, but this is the only kind of poem, this, this is the only kind of high modernist poem that the average reader can understand and enjoy. Neither Eliot, nor Pound, nor Stein, can attract the average reader. Hmm. Okay, Williams's poems can incorporate the reader to their perspective as easily as the camera incorporates the spectator. An advantage must be taken from this of this attraction to present the reader with that structure that can favor his or her critical awakening. In my opinion, this is what William does most of the time in his poems, in spite of this tension between objectivism and objectification that I'm going to try to illustrate in a minute. In Williams's poems, you always find some dose of experimentation that is challenging for the reader and can contribute to the critical awakening of the reader. The first point that I'm going to to discuss is the poem Apology, and this poem is the point in which the word non-entity appears, and this is a poem published in 1917 in the collection Al Que Quiere. Yeah. According to Marjorie Petloff, <clears throat> this work is Williams's first significant tribute to the printed page as poetic unit. The typographical layout as a central fact of poetic discourse. In this poem, which is not radically experimental, you can see. Oh, we have to. Do we have to? Find, uh, no, no. You have photocopies. You have photocopies. You have. Uh, no, problem. Yeah, no problem. Okay, sorry. So, in this poem, the typographical layout, in a modest way, it's not a very, very complicated or sophisticated poem. We can find that the structure is meaningful, as meaningful as the words included in it. We can find, for instance, the proposition of, at the end of the second line of the poem, to isolate the terrible faces. Normally, the preposition of, in more me mechanical versions of free verse, would appear at the beginning of the line. By the same token, like, at the end of the sixth line in the second stanza, to isolate the image old Florentine oak, which describes the faces of the social non-entities. In both cases, the impact of the content is somehow eh, supported by the contribution of the form. Something similar happens with but not. In the penultimate line of the poem, in order to emphasize the difference between the speaker's interest in the social non-entities and in the leading citizens to the detriment of the latter. Well, normally, but not, are words which appear in longer lines and in stress. Here are concentrated precisely to produce that effect. But the most remarkable structural element is in the poem is the fourth stanza, because the fourth stanza is constituted just by one word, the word also. And so here we can perceive clearly what is the difference between the literal meaning of the word and the meaning which emerges and the meaning which emerges from the visual display of the word on the page. Because the word on the page marks difference, distance, a frontier between the two parts of the poem that to some extent shows the abyss that exists between the two social classes mentioned in the poem and in the interest that the poet 
fields with these two social groups. However, in this poem, we have the word beauty, and the word beauty is a very dangerous word, particularly when applied to human beings. Hmm. It tends to objectify. And in my opinion, to associate oxymoronically the concept of beauty with the terrible faces of our non-entities has a flavor, inevitable flavor of aestheticization. Mm -hmm. So, objectification. This is what I call a tension between objectivism and uh, objectification. In the poem pastoral, in the poem pastoral, which is, we find something similar, this kind of tension. <clears throat> and, but this poem is also a very good example of Williams's perspectivism. We find that the poem begins with the American dominant perspective. That is, the premises of the American dream, the ideal of self-reliance, and the ideal of self of the self-made man. The speaker says, when I was younger, it was plain to me I must make something of myself. Older now, he has been able to create a critical perspective of his own. And he says, older now, I walk back streets admiring the houses of the very poor. But to express admiration for the poor hmm. can be objectified, can reveal kind of self-complacency on the part of the speaker in the absence of a commitment to action, in the absence of a commitment to poetical action. Hmm. And this is something that Williams realizes, and this is why he devises is an objective strategy based on mentioning a series of objects which represent the struggles for survival as well as the invisibility of the social non-entities. We don't see either their faces or their bodies, but they have become visible. Mm -hmm. Through this playing with visibility and invisibility, the non-entity has been transformed into an entity without seeing them. But immediately, a third perspective is added, a perspective that I would identify as Dionysian, or hedonist, or aestheticist. We read all, all this objectual world eh, of the, of the non-entities, if I am fortunate, smear a bluish green that properly weather pleases me best of all colors. Now, something has been broken. Mm -hmm. And the thing that has been broken is the ironical relationship between the title of the poem, Pastoral, and the content of the poem, because this objectual world of the social non-entities has nothing to do with the Loco Samoenos, eh? mm -hmm. uh, suggested by the title. Now, that relationship becomes literal, because the bluish green evokes the pastoral in an impressionistic way and probably satisfies the speaker's narcissistic craving for beauty. The price he pays for this is the invisibilization of those he has made visible with his objectivist approach. As I have anticipated, the Red Wheelbarrow is the best example of objectivism based on the structure of the poem as well as, as, on, the, as, well as on the objectual nature of the central element. There has been some debate about what is the thing that depends so much on this particular Red Wheelbarrow. And my opinion is that that thing is precisely that instrument known as a Wheelbarrow in universal terms. That is, from the particular to the universal, which is another maxim of William says, William says poetic. What the poet has done is to give an entity to a normally unheeded instrument, connected with specific mode of production, an instrument that represents very well the invisibility of the non-entity, that thing which is there in the life world that no one pays attention to. And this objectual non-entity inevitably evokes the body of that human non-entity who normally under circumstances of exploitation uses it for the benefit of that society that does not take him into account. In short, the red wheelbarrow illuminates the anonymous existence of the wheelbarrow and of the worker attached to it in the context of the mode of production of capitalism. In this respect, the question of the aura becomes important. Because there are critics who consider that this poem is an example of the ready-made. <laughs> According to Sire, this material, the material 
which composes Williams' poem, begins to take the aura of Marcel Duchamp's famous ready mates But we have learned that the aura of the work of art is an obstacle for the critical awakening of the reader. Mm -hmm. And so, I don't know, intuitively, unconsciously, Williams does exactly the opposite. What William does is to efface the aura of the image, an image that might have been perfectly treated in the way of an imagist poem. Again, that brief and cute thing that almost everybody can understand and enjoy. What William does is to use the structure of the poem to take the reader from contemplation to the threshold of reflection. From the mere instantaneous impression to the breaking down of that impression into a structure innovative enough to make the reader aware, perhaps in a distracted way, of the labor function in the poem. The suspension caused by the separation of semantic units inside the stanzas and between the four stanzas brings the reader's detachment from the instantaneous and beautiful image. And somehow, he or she becomes aware of the form. The awakening of a critical spirit is incompatible with the passive reception of the work of art. A creative structure is necessary to encourage the reader's critical participation, and this is the only, the only kind of action that a modernist, objectivist, and experimental poet can take to express his commitment to the social non-entities without objectifying them. But in order to produce any effect on the reader, we need a reader. Poetry needs readers. And the key for this goal resides in the correct dose, in the balance between experimentation and accessibility, which characterizes Williams's poetry. Dr. Williams, the general practitioner and pediatrician, shows that he was an expert in the administration of the correct dose. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, see if we're going to load the next piece of information. I don't have the complete text. That's the problem. Yeah, yeah, no, no problem. No problem. I didn't realize. I didn't realize either. Sorry. Logistical changes here. Okay. Um, I don't want to look at. I guess that's the question. Okay. Um, our next speaker is Esther Sanchez Hardo, a professor of English at the Complutense. Um, oh, no, oh, yes, thank you, thank you. <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, yeah, Esther Sanchez Hardo, professor of English at the Complutense. Um, she authored Cultures of the Death Drive, Melanie Klein and Modernist Melancholia from Duke University Press in 2003. Tologia Mina Loy. From Huerga y Fierro, uh, 2009. She recently co edited Écriture Désirante, Bura, from Laramati, and Women, Poets, and Myth, Cambridge Scholars, uh, 2018. Uh, and finally, no, not finally, two more <laughs> Myth and Environmentalism, Arts of Resilience for a Damaged Planet, from Rulich. And um, she's editor of Poéticas Comparadas de Mujeres, Las Poetas y la Transformación del Discurso Poético. In los siglos 2021. So, um, <laughs> thank you very much. Especially, I would like to thank all participants in the conference. I would like to thank my organizers, Dr. Andui, my colleagues here, and especially, especially the students who are attending this these two very intense days. Thank you so much. Um, I have the feeling that I. Like the majority of us, I had to rush through the materials I put together for this because they were, and uh, they started growing uh, and they became overwhelming. And the poems we all picked up, as it has been amply shown, are um, 
inexhaustible. So um, I, I'm going to try to do my best as uh, the rest of participants, but it, it, it is huge. And I'll try to, to be brief and not controversial if I can. So, okay. Um, as an almost epochal sign within the modernist era, Poets devoted their energies to write about the changing and often somber times between the two world wars. The generation born at the turn of the 20th century, that of Williams, encounters a world severely hit by war, economic recession, and dependency disease, and harsh living conditions. Approaching loss under its many faces, as it is the case in the Freudian classical account in Mourning and Melancholia, 1916, as it is well known, I will try to approach this sense of loss through a reading and an approach of Williams's and Lebertov's poems, a Little Selection. From the start, um, and after, of course, being researching this, I would like, uh, for a while, I would like to suggest several things. These are four points I would like to make. First is that the elegy in its evolution and mutations comes to modernism and beyond as an important genre, probably less crucial due to its embeddedness in dark times. And it is not until Winston Hugh Oden, the British American poet, writes his major elegies that we can reassess the overall value of the elegy its objectives, significance, social function at this historical moment. Second is that in the inter-arts context in which the avant-garde and the first generation of poets and painters, imagism, cubism, even vorticism, the proximity between the elegy and the still life is remarkable. This is due to the fact that both genres deal with death, inanimate objects or realities forever lost. Third is that the elegy and the still life act as engines of dynamize, dynamization of literary history and art history and give rise to variations and hybridizations that result in new genres such as the photographic elegy, the still life portrait, and even the pseudo elegy or the still life to which the human figure is added. And fourth point would be that the elegy and the still life perform a mournful task by virtue of which the artist invokes the disappearance of the object in her work and brings it back to verbal existence. Okay, regarding my major idea in this paper and with painting and also write, writing as, as at its basis, I will be holding that the still life is an elegiac form. What is painted is no longer alive and it has been substituted by a representation and image. Uh, the idea that the still life can be considered um, as an elegiac form is based upon the fact that the depicted objects that are removed from the original context are no longer alive in the traditional sense are captured and preserved through painting. The still life can evoke loss, a sense of loss, tensions, and the passage of time. Uh, all these works usually include objects such as uh, skulls um, in different um, traditions that we find and I have listed here for us just to remind us. Um, lost transients, the passage of time, are present there in ever since the 16th and 17th centuries in the Vanitas tradition in painting. Um, extinguished candles, withered flowers, skulls represented. In the Memento Mori tradition, with its symbolism associated, incorporating symbolic elements that allude to mortality, decay, the passage of time, um, the ephemeral beauty that uh, is all over the place. Also, the aestheticization of the ordinary when the still life uh, depicting um, ordinary everyday objects um, 
evokes a sense of nostalgia sometimes, an elegiac longing for a bygone era or a simpler time. Uh, these, all these views suggest that uh, we can understand also the still life as uh, an elegiac form in painting. Okay, I'm of course quickly jumping ahead to the selection of poems I, I am suggesting at this point. I'm starting with Williams and with a couple of poems which are, I will let you know, um, huge. Um, especially the second one, which is, I'm going to, as it shows in my abstract first, um, devote a little time to this 1907 important poem was um, addressed uh, just by mentioning it yesterday, Dedication for a Plot of Ground, and second would be Crimson Cyclamen, which is the elegy devoted to Charles Demus, the painter. Okay, this poem here, uh, published three years before Emily Dickinson welcomed William's paternal grandmother passed away. Uh, strictly speaking, it's not an elegy, but comes very close to what we understand by elegy. The poem is mourning the loss of the, vital the vitality, the energy, and the projects and expectations of youth, and revises in admiration the many achievements that this woman made. The poem, as all elegies, is dedicated to, you go to the poem, the living presence, uh, of Emily Dickinson welcome and to a crucial element that appears in the majority of William's elegies, which is geographical displacement, exile and adaptation to a new land and a new environment. The remembrance of his paternal grandmother, who virtually took over the raising of Williams and his brother Edgar, remained a key presence in the poet's life. The poem is describing with a very fast tempo the ups and downs of this woman's life as she travels from, from England to New York, the Azores, Brooklyn, Puerto Rico, St. Thomas, St. Domingo, and New York again, with two marriages, twice widowed, after losing a daughter and a young son. Her grandmother's strength and determination led her to fight alone against the elements. The struggle to be the owner of her land serves, according to scholar Bern Rutzala, as the main engine of William's identifications with her. In this researcher's view, Rutzala's view, dedication can be understood as an authentic ars poetica in which Williams, by analogy, works and gains a foothold on his New Jersey land in the same way that uh, his grandmother obtained property in West Haven on Long Island Sound. In the poem, the juxtaposition of syntax with verbs that essentially denote movement, action, present a narrative structure that follows the oratorial outline of a public speech, its main features are the use of syntactic parallelism, repetitions, enumerations of juxtaposed elements. And the poem closes. Uh, the first lengthy stanza with 11 cascading lines in which the strength, moral and physical superiority and the determination of his grandmother result in a remarkable personal portrait of an iron will. The portrait of Emily Dickinson welcome is a psychological portrait and the elegiac tone of the poem recreates with insight the character and determination of this woman's circumspect character. As Professor Christopher McGowan in the room reads the final lines of William's poems, last lines, if you can bring nothing to this place but your carcass, keep out, he says. Once she dies, her legacy will be that living presence extending beyond the death of her body, end quote. Clearly, the poem is part biography, part elegy. The elegiac tone is explicit in foregrounding what remains, and it is only what remains, that is, the territory of the elegy. The visual element and the still life connection lies in the image of the plot of ground, in my view, and in the mater material and psychological portrait of William's grandmother. There is a transposition between, between the much sought after plot of ground and the figure of the grandmother. The reader can well visualize the almighty grandmother as a force of nature. Her strength and survival strategies surpass everything imaginable. The final image with the grandmother grabbing this earth with her own hands testifies to the persistence of the memory of this remarkable woman. It operates as a picture. I would like to suggest it may well be still life. 
in which life is read as an endless struggle and earthly possessions are only short-lived and transitory. Thus, dedication for a plot of ground from Latin dedicationem, from dedicare, consecrate, proclaim, affirm, might as well be a canvas with a portrait of William's grandmother in her natural environment, even if the still life contained from early on 18th century, especially fragments of landscape, sometimes Prado Museum, I can tell you later if you want, have references not really showing them at this point. Landscape can be used as a framing device in some still lives with um, inanimate um, entities. In this specific case, the plot of land and the cottage at, at West Haven where Emily Dickinson well, li lived for 15 years and finally died are also as an important paratextual frame. Okay. Um, okay, this is very complicated. Everybody knows that this is very complicated, this poem, which is um, unique and fantastic and the only one elegy that has been written in such a way. To my knowledge, 1936, Crimson Cyclamen, dedicated to the memory of the painter Charles Temus. Unique, a challenge, fantastic challenge. Paul Mariani, uh, Williams' biographer, estimates that, I quote, over a lifetime, Williams has written 200 flower poems, an impressive flower, flowers, okay, impressive number within a total lyric output of approximately 600 works, end quote. Uh, in Crimson Cyclamen, Williams' own personal homage to the craft of the painter in which color and form, light and perspective, this is a short eight pages long poem, okay, elegy. Um, this is uh, my selection for us at this point. Uh, personal hom homage to the craft of the painter in which color and form, light and perspective, verticality and horizontality, center and edges, thick brush stroke versus fading surfaces come to the forefront. This is certainly a unique piece, a splendid, difficult to define and sometimes difficult to follow piece where Williams in a virtuoso exercise of balance between excess and contention takes us into the inner life of a plant and its exteriority, its structure form, the minute description of its different part, its blossoming movement, everyday life and breeding, and finally its decay and death. It is a unique elegy with resist narration, it is an elegy in which by recourse to allusion metaphor, the fusion of concrete material elements and abstraction, Williams addresses the figure of a crimson cyclamen and takes a close-up look to the composition of this plant. Leaves, flower, its growth, habit, sheer elegance. Regarding to form and rhythm, the stand side, you can't really appreciate it here, and rhythmic pattern manifests three different structural patterns. Poem retains its original rhythm in the first seven stanzas. From the seventh onward, the poem breaks into 17 small four-line units, and finally the last nine stanzas oscillate between six and ten lines, closing with the last nine sort nine line sort of coda. Uh, the poem in its austere beauty is a serial composition of 252 lines which creates a tempo of its own. Beginning with a description of the cyclamen's color, it reminds us of the opening of William's The Pot of Flowers, poem devoted to Demot's painting Two Veroses, yesterday shown by writer Belen Gace. Color and form, the bright and intense crimson and the contour of the petals of the cyclamen get them mesh, and it is there where the painting gives way to the analogy created between the immaterial materialism of the canvas and the precisionism of the most painting style. Um, Williams and the most lived all by the countryside. I assume that in both cases, their familiarity with the environment and the natural world, in the case of Demuth, it was the flower garden and the huge garden of uh, his family at home. Um, I assume that many of, in their compositions, and especially Demuth as a painter, many of those were still lives. The still life as we know it visualizes this ambivalent relation between aliveness and death. The painter captures the object on the transit from animate to inanimate entity. 
In the first seven stanzas in the poem, William's mastery of a rich palette where color and shape so through a depurated scripted technique mingle, introducing us as readers to the stunning beauty of the cyclamen as a thing of nature and through the natural process of unfolding and growing of the different parts of the plant, the cyclamen appears miraculously, miraculously. In the midst of William's empirical description of the plant with a scientist's eye, the enigma on beauty of beauty and the urgence and pushing ahead of life follows unheeded, slowly but surely. The poem proceeds with a faster tempo, also the smaller stanzas and reaches momentum upon the only uh, two-line stanza, two-line or couplet, you know, uh, past the middle of the poem. You have it on the on the you know the beginning first two stanzas you have, and then this sort of climax. The flower flows to release. You have it there on the on the screen. William is definitely mixing very deftly mixing the language of empirical description, affective register, which he addresses the sort of state of soul in which the dynamic energy of the plant fits the poem, and the poem conveys a faithful rendition of the passionate painter in his atelier, drawing, delineating, using the watercolors to portray organic life. The poem proceeds through all stages of the petals' movement, as if testing the limits on the petals of the flower, take a convoluted path until they fall exactly where they belong. From the lexis of passion, excess, and ecstasy, stanzas 20, 21, and 23, coincident with the siglament's full bloom, the plant does not transition slowly into its usual dormant state prior to the next season. Rather, the leaves begin to yellow and wither. At this point, the flower grows desiccated, the color pales, and the petals flow, and the petals fall. In this transit from life to decay and death, the poem mourns how the plant's structure and form no longer hold. It loses freshness and wither just as humans grow old and the lushness of youth gives way to the feebleness of age. Uh, okay, it seems to me that this is what delineates the territory of the elegy proper. The crimson cyclamen moves the fading and ultimately dying of the cyclamen plant. Um, and parallelly, the severe illness, you know, he was a diabetic, Charles Demos, and was first treated by with insulin, but it didn't go well in his case. William was with his, um, you know, very well, this better than I do, colleague, friend, um, and also gave him some medical advice. Here, uh, you know, severe illness, prostration, distress, and the passing of Charles Demos. The here the elegy occupies the stretch of the canvas where the cyclamen is represented, paying homage to Demos' many achievements in art, but the transient and the ephemerality of life crystallizes in the still image of merging. Uh, here at the very end of the poem, there is a, an image of merging where the cyclamen in which probably Demos' life and William's meditation of death merge into one flower, and Demos' passing is embedded into a larger organic process, which is that of the life cycle. Okay, this is one of his paintings. He was a watercolorist, very accomplished, and there is a museum I have not visited yet, but I will for sure because it is very interesting the way it, it was um, remodeled recently. And there is a plenty of information online that you can follow. It's fantastic on demos, plenty of information, good information, and even research, because they are promoting research with, um, with grants, with a grant or a couple of grants that they have. And they have young scholars, very gifted, very talented on the work of Demuth. So I, we have to take the next uh, meeting uh, nearby and then uh, go on an expedition to the, to the museum and maybe, yeah, to learn much more about Williams and Demuth and the whole, and the whole flower, flower plots. Yeah, you know. Uh, yeah, so, of course, Denise, 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 never talk. Of course, 1967, for the first time in the Sorrow Dance, her book, The Sorrow Dance, um, uh, includes 
this elegy, eight pages long, amazing, eight pages long, like Crimson Siglamen, eight pages long, you know, seven, eight, depending on the edition, of course. Olga poems, Olga poems, her sister, you know, piano player, the dancer, piano player, the dancer, both intellectuals, both activists, family, which is a microcosm of the world, you know, a Levitov's family. So poignant uh, collection dedicated these eight pages to her deceased sister, Olga, the poems exploring the themes of loss, of course, grief, remembrance, and the enduring both between uh, both of them. Personal introspective approach allowing uh, readers to share this in this emotional journey as she grapples with the absence of her sister. I'm using the sixth and last stanza in the Olga poems. The Olga poems are absolutely um, impressive, impressive, impressive. So I would like to, to add you at this point for a reading of uh, section six, the last one, uh, not as an elegy, but as, as a still life, based upon a snapshot that she refers to in the poem taken six years six years before I was born. You know, the time uh, time difference between the sisters was nine years. She, uh, Olga was the eldest. And um, Levertov contemplates here her sister's eyes. It's a highly pictorial scene, the corollary of this sixth section in which the senses, sight, hearing, and the perception of enigma or mystery, and so many difficulties like mental problems, poverty, deprivation of her loved ones, in the case of her sister's life, give us an accurate physical and psychological portrait of Olga Levertov. Visuality and vision dominate the scene with the hard or veiled or shining unknowable, unknowable, unknowable gaze of her sister, of Olga presiding this scene most likely to be that of the end of her life. The poem navigates into the travel waters of temporality with flashbacks in which music and movement, piano and dance, as the two sister arts in which Olga and Denise excel, bring to mind the elder sisters last solo performance. Olga's turning savagely to the piano and playing straight through all the sonatas by Beethoven. Levertov deftly manages light in this last poem where Olga's eyes are foregrounded and speaks of her sisters keeping always compassion candle alight and turns to Olga's favorite Louis Magny's poem Selva Oscura alluding to a clearing, to a house whose door swings open and a hand beckons in welcome as some sort of funereal light. Light, the movement across water, crossing... I'm sorry. Okay. Okay. Yes. Mm. Let me, let me, let me close this because I want to show you a, a, a piece of painting. Okay, this was my uh, choice, and we can, of course, uh, this was my choice because this is very visual, and it is the Jewish painter from Belarus, um, Sutin, to which um, uh, um, Levertov devotes in Edor in the Hive, 1989, this very important poem. Just show you the still life quality and a landscape on the other side. This is 1916, the still life with the herrings. I want to say, I was making a reading just let you know one thing what I have attempted to show today this I have a complete shortened but anyway sorry to keep you so long I have attempted to show and I can go on talking to any of you about this any issues related that the languages of the allergy and the still life become almost interchangeable at this moment their emergence and proliferation in their specific milieu speak to us in parallel of crucial questions in literary and art history, as much as about the condition of the individual in the 20s and 30s, facing progress without being sufficiently equipped for the radical change of a fractured world in permanent conflict and transformation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.
Uh, thank you, Sen. Um, it really is painful to have to cut these wonderful presentations off, but um, in the interest of fairness, I'm going to be brutal, and hopefully we can return to things in, in discussion. Um, our next speaker is Mark Long, Professor Emeritus at, of English at Keene State College. For, for 23 years, he's taught writing, literature, and the environmental humanities. His publications include essays on American poets and poetics, the environmental humanities, and the profession of English studies. His most recent scholarly contributions include the essay, What Stayed With Me? Art, Conviviality, and Culture in William Carlos Williams and Gary Snyder in a special issue of the William Carlos, um, oh, in a special issue of the William Carlos Williams Review that he's guest editing dedicated to William Carlos Williams, American Modernism, and West Coast Culture. And another essay, um, Postmodern, Postnatural Modernism, which appeared in the Wiley Companion to American Poetry. Uh, Mark is currently the president of the William Carlos Williams Society. Okay, and To meet all of you, um, but also um, because it brings it brings me back uh, to um, the first two essays I published back in the 1990s, um, one on Williams' Spring and All, um, and the second was on Denise Levertov, her late poems that she wrote during the years when she was in Seattle. So it's a wonderful occasion. Thank you. So the title of my paper, and also um, thank you to the students for being here. Um, I, I hope I can provide some uh, interest and entertainment in the next uh, 20 minutes. Uh, my title is, In What Directions Should the Formal Tend? The Presence of William Carlos Williams in the Correspondence of Denise Levertov and A.R. Ammons. And that phrase comes from one of the letters that I'll be quoting. In her obituary in The Nation on March 16, 1963, Denise Levertov writes, William Carlos Williams has left us more than we realize. Even those, an increasing number in recent years, who love his work are often curiously unfamiliar with it. Not because they have not troubled to read it well, but because of its inner abundance and intrinsic freshness. More than anyone else, Levertov continues, Williams made available to us the whole range of the language. He showed us the rhythms of speech as poetry, the rhythms and idioms not only of what we say aloud, but of what we say in our thoughts. Levertov cautions her readers not to assume that the American idiom, and these are her words, ever implied a reduction. On the contrary, it means the recognition of wide resources. Uh, wide re she was drawn to William's emphasis on poetry, and again, these are her words, freed from the rhythmic patterns that have become habitual and inapt that can help us discover the rhythms in our experience. He cleared the ground. He gave us tools. Later that year, in November of 1963, Robert Duncan, in a letter to Levertov, recalls Williams preparing the way. Over a decade earlier, while he fended off critics, such as Madeleine Gleason, the founder of the San Francisco Poetry Guild, and later the director of the Festival of Modern Poetry, responding to Duncan's admiration of Williams Patterson. And she writes, I know you are excited by this poem, Robert, but do you really think anyone will be reading him 10 years from now? Duncan's letter offers a detailed account of phases in Levertov's poetry, clusters of poems listed, to which Levertov responds with gratitude. In a notebook entry she shares with Duncan in her response, she underscores the, quote, re-entry into my life of the magic of the romantic, which had been submerged, and of Williams's influence, the poem is a kind of machine, etc., and Creeley and Pound's emphasis on a kind of economy, all of which were necessary for me, too, in learning to get beyond the vagueness of my early English poems. For so many of Levertov's generation, Williams remained an inescapable presence. Readers of Williams will recognize Levertov's reference to the poem as a kind of machine, from his author's introduction to the 1944 collection of The Wedge. 
a generative text that circulated among poets in the 1950s and 60s. Joel Duncan observes that, quote, for modernists, both the poem and the machine are organically generative rather than descriptive, with the self-propulsion and potential threat of machines offering poetry a powerful metaphor for how to advance immediate experience over inherited genres. Williams describes the movement of the machine as intrinsic, undulant, a physical more than a literary character. This intrinsic, undulant, physical movement of a poem is inseparable, Williams insists, from the character of the speech from which it arises. For it isn't what the poet says that counts of a work of art, he insists. It's what he makes, with such intensity of perception that it lives with an intrinsic movement of its own to verify its authenticity. The condition of authenticity in this formulation is intensity of perception. And readers of Levertov will undoubtedly hear in this language her own emphasis on the intensities of apperception and intrinsic movements of a poem, what Joel Duncan calls her incarnational organicism. In the early 1960s, as she worked out the ideas that would inform her lecture asking the fact for the form, that she delivered at Wabash College in December of 1962, and her essay, Some Notes on Organic Form, that first appeared in the September 1965 issue of Poetry Magazine, Levertov began a correspondence with A.R. Ammons. When they began exchanging letters, Levertov had recently published three books, Here and Now, With Eyes at the Back of Our Heads, and The Jacob's Ladder. Ten of her poems had appeared in Donald Allen's 1960, The New American Poetry. And she was one of three poets in the anthology with Gregory Corso and Lawrence Ferlinghetti, who James Laughlin had brought to New Directions Press. In his essay, Unerasing Early Levertov, the poet Ron Silman writes, she held the visible connection back to a poetics of William Carlos Williams with its premise of discourse built upon plain speech. Ammons, on the other hand, was still finding his way. As a journal entry in 1960 suggests, and I'm going to read you a passage from the journal. I wish I could put into words the coming round I have experienced intellectually the last few years. I once despised feeling as worthless, evanescent, of no external significance. I thought only of the permanent outside, the revolving galaxies, the endless space, and man on his tiny speck seem meaningless. Can I now make a shift to humanity? Can I feel again? Can my blood stir at last, he asks himself. I now see feeling as incorporating the intellect. I once saw them as separate. This recognition suggests Ammons was also on the move. From his more hermetic poems in the 1950s to the more expansive poems that began circulating in literary journals and magazines, and that would appear in his forthcoming books, Expressions of Sea Level, published in 1964, Corson's Inlet, and Tape for the Turn of the Year, his first book-length poem, published in 19, uh, 1965, and Northfield Poems in 1966. Levertov first wrote to Ammons in the summer of 1961. She had read his review of three books for Poetry Magazine, a review that included the recently published City Lights edition of Robert Duncan's selected poems. She was not pleased. Though she forgives Ammons after reading some of his poems, and as poetry editor of The Nation, she asks whether Ammons might have any poems for the magazine. What follows over the next few years, between 1961 and 1964, is a remarkable correspondence that expresses mutual admiration, a growing friendship, and a significant dialogue about poetic form, an exchange that Kevin McGurk calls Ammon's sojourn in the field of Black Mountain poetics. I first read these letters in the archive of Ammon's manuscripts and journals and correspondence at Cornell University. Though 26 of the letters, some of the letters are marked unsent, written between 1961 and 1964, and appear in a 2012 special edition of the Chicago Review. When I first encountered this correspondence, I was especially taken 
with a sequence of letters written in the summer and fall of 1962. And in my talk today, I'll highlight the intense exchange in these letters about poetic form and values. I'm especially interested in the genesis of Levertov's idea of organic form in relation to Ammons' ideas about form and the critical implications of this dialogue for understanding the persistent presence of Williams in the second half of the 20th century. What did these two poets have to say when one another, and how might their letters inform our explorations of Williams' presence in the work of Ammons and Levertov? Okay, so I'm going to talk about inner and outer necessities. That's also a phrase from Ammons. In the fall of 1961, soon after their correspondence began, Levertov sent Ammons a series of suggestions for his poem Visit, a 35-line poem in seven stanzas that she had selected to appear in the nation, and that would later find its place as the first poem in Ammons' book Corson's Inlet. Levertov's suggestions include adding periods to, as she put it, better express the actual natural pace of reading. Ammons responded, I don't think so, because there are no periods in the whole poem, as I want to maintain a sense of continuity, just as the river is continuous, and just as there are no major breaks in the flowing quality of life proposed in the poem. Then in January, Ammon shares with Levertov his impressions of the second stanza of Levertov's The World Outside that appeared in the Jacob's Ladder. And I'll quote from that poem, that stanza. I'll quote the whole stanza. The goat herd upstairs, music from his sweet flute, rose from summer to summer in the dusty air of air shafts and among the flakes of soot that float in a daze from the chimney. The chimney, notes, remote, cool, speaking of slender shadows under olive leaves, a silence. Ammons praises the self-existence of the stanza, beautifully in sound, but also in idea and image. I'm quoting from him, Rose is perfect, the repetition of air and the solid ending of air shafts, the way soot is tied between flakes and float and is re-echoed in the oat. It is certainly mastery but all with the ease that confirms your sense of movement with its abruptness, surprises, releases, comes instinctively as the completion or fulfillment of all other aspects of meaning the poem is carrying forward. In a letter Ammon sent to Levertov in June 1962, though, the conversation shifts. From comments and suggestions on individual poems to this remarkable exchange about poetics and poetic values. And here's Ammons. I'm not entirely satisfied with free verse anymore, even the kind of free verse that has its own inner organic necessity. There has got to be a better form, one that works with the inner and outer necessities, making all values look deliberate instead of accidental, even when accidental. Modern poets are not getting the most out of the language have no idea what the new form could be as yet. In August that year, writing from Temple, Maine, Levertov responds with a cautionary note, explaining what she calls, and now I'm quoting from Levertov, the danger in your method, the too much logic leading to too much talk, the over-intellection of everything. Echo echoing the assessment of James Laughlin in a letter that she shared with Ammons, she advises, I think you have to learn to be ruthless about cutting out poems or sections whose importance to you is that they are part of a sequence of thought. Then in another letter, she responds to Ammons' uncertainties about free verse. What you're saying, she writes, is very close to what Williams has been saying for years. Notes on measure, etc. She then offers her version of a better form. The way, I think, lies in one, making organic, miscalled free structure, more organic, and two, by binding or knitting together its elements, densifying its texture, by more attention to repetitions within it, repetitions unobvious, subliminally absorbed by the reader. She explains her belief in a form, a pattern, what Hopkins called inscape, 
in everything if we can learn to discover it, a constellation of perceptions of experience that can create a texture complex and harmonic rather than thinly simple and linear. But in a postscript, she asks, what do you mean by outer necessities? In his detailed response to Let Levertov's letter on form and her questions about outer necessities, Ammons offers a section of a 70-line poem that would take the title Identity in his book Expressions of Sea Level. And if you don't know Ammons, you need to know that he's really the, the, um, the master of the book-length poem uh, in the second half of the 20th century. He wrote a number of them. Uh, Tape for the Turn of the Year was his first in 1965. Um, and so he, centered, he, he centers this, the excerpt that he gives her, it's um, describing a spider uh, and a spider's web in a garden. And here are the lines of the poem excerpted. If the web were perfectly preset, the spider would never find a perfect place to set it in. And if the web were perfectly adaptable, if freedom and possibility were without limit, the web would lose its special identity. Ammons explains that identity, the poem, is in part a commentary on the art of writing poetry, although it's at the same time a poem preoccupied, as he writes, with any form of knowledge, experience, or existence. And he goes on. This is a long letter, and I'm just going to quote a few parts. I think the web here is the constellation you mention. I call it a field as Olson, I think, does, using the scientific meaning of classical versus quantum fields. Fields of order occur out of random. It's the freedom to occur from disorder that makes possible new fields, new things in new fields. If we imposed upon random a classical field, then we would violate to some extent the actual total operation of the field. This is an old, old problem and it applies to so many areas and is actually the central problem of my cantos. This explanation begins to surface what a woman sitting two, uh, two people down from me, Anne Dewey, calls, um, and, and I, I really admire this, um, conceived uh, that, that a poet conceived not as order-imposing artificer, but as a transmitter of environmental forces. It's a crucial distinction, I think, for understanding Ammons. A poetics that Ammons will elaborate in his longer discursive poems and his statements on poetics. And that's the part I cut out. In both his lyrics and in the lyrical movements of his book-length poems, Ammons' central trope is motion, and his impulse is to resist closure formally, thematically, and in his signature use of the colon as a mark of punctuation and poetic gesture. His preoccupation with process and the almost obsessive preoccupation with epistemologies of relational knowing are at the center of his correspondence with Levertov. And so um, I'm, I'm now going to... Um, uh, uh, move to another comment that Ammons makes in this long letter to, to Levertov, specifically addressing her ideas about organic form. What you say about organic verse is wonderfully, wonderfully true. And the truth of it is that the poems you've produced done beautifully beyond belief. But even with texture, with densifying of sound and clustral meeting, you can put a bit on the mare. And this is the point I had in mind, an examination of the value of arbitrariness. I believe that it is possible to write an immortal poem, utterly free of any device, including arbitrary form, movement, texture, whatever. An utterly naked poem that appeals beyond all sounds, relationships, repetitions, etc. I'm not going to write such a poem if it happens to me, fine. So I've got to cut out a little bit more here. So let me just uh, do that. 
the letter goes on and he continues to quote from uh, uh, passages of his, um, his poem, Corson's Inlet. And if you haven't read any Ammons to understand his poetics, Corson's Inlet is a good, a good poem to start with. I want, to, I want to get to the point where he's uh, talking about external uh, limitations. So, so um, Ammons continues, if, if you set barriers and limitations, rules and methods to a poem, you can come very close to the full realization of the limited form. form. The poem that tries to imitate nature directly must inevitably and grossly fall short. That's why I'm thinking of external imposed limitations, not the inexhaustible, unmanageable internal growth of the poem. Ammons explains, the mind can't perceive except by limiting, by blocking things off, by naming them. The moment the line has been drawn, fidelity to nature is impossible because it has no sharp lines, but only the massive events of transition. This is the heart of the problem. If art is opposite to nature, if art is the means by which wholeness can be realized in the fragment, then aren't we making a mistake to loosen the form that is to hold the wholeness? It's just a question. You've seen from the quoted fragments of my verse, I'm preaching the opposite doctrine. Okay, so I'll just conclude. Just give me one more minute. Yeah, okay. Um, there's a lot more to say here. This, this, these, this is, it's just... A, a, one exchange of two letters, and and so it's um, it's hard to fit <laughs> fit in the relevant parts. So, including my my remarks today, I want to return to my opening one of my opening questions: How might the Levertov Ammons uh, letters inform our explorations of Williams' presence in the work of these two poets? First, I want to suggest that in listening in on these exchanges, we find Ammons is a more direct catalyst for what Levertov calls a thing about organic form as she calls it in a letter to Duncan, and in which she mentions to Ammons, in which she includes the typescript of her lecture as asking the fact for the form. Second, it's therefore possible to consider her essay some notes on organic form, form as an extension of the collaborative exploration of ideas between these two poets in 1962. Third, although the levertov ammons correspondence would devolve into a sharp divergence in poetic commitments, I would suggest that the letters are usefully read along Levertov's correspondence with Robert Duncan, particularly their exchanges about free verse and the organic poet, which happened a year later in 1963. Finally, Levertov's dialogue with Ammons is um, it's important for understand, I, I think that the affinities of Williams and Ammons offer insights into this particular phase of Levertov's organicist poetics in the 1960s, at the moment when Ammons moves from what Carrie Wolfe describes as the close space of self-contained organic form, which partakes, Coleridge put it, of transcendent substance. In the estimation of Wolfe, Ammons's poetics are increasingly open to the accidental and haphazard, and thus to new information and patterning. And I'll end with a comment uh, similarly from Ammons in his 1972 book length poem called Sphere. I'm sick of good poems. All those little rondeurs splendidly brought off, painted gourds on a shelf. Give me the dumb, debilitated, nasty, and massive, if that's the alternative. Touch the universe anywhere, you touch it everywhere. Thanks. Thank you very much, Yes. And um, let's see, Sarah, could you yeah, yeah, open you. and then pass the clicker, please? Oh, yeah. Thanks. Okay. Our next speaker is uh, Maria Porras Sanchez. She's an assistant professor in the Department of English Studies, the Complutense. Uh, her main research areas okay, are uh, graphic narratives in comics, literary translation, and post colonial and transnational literatures in English, with an interest in themes such as precarity, migration, ness, and myth their intersections with race, ethnicity, class, gender, and sexuality. With Gerardo Vilches, um, she has co-edited Precarious Youth in Contemporary Graphic Narratives, uh, Young Lives in Crisis, Ridge 2022, 
and with Esther Sanchez Pardo and Pedro Rosa Borillo, Women, Poets, and Myth in the 20th and 21st Centuries on Sappho's website, Cambridge Scholars 2018. She's translated more than 30 works, including novels, essays, young adult fiction, and illustrated books. She's edited and translated Headscarves and Hymens, The Middle East Needs a Sexual Revolution from Capitan Swing, uh, 2018, uh, by Mona Tawi. Thank you. <laughs> uh, Hood Feminism Notes from the Women That a Movement Forgot, also Capitan Swing, in 2022 by Mickey Kendall. And her last work to date is the volume Myth and Environmentalism, of Resilience for a Damaged Planet, Rutledge 2023, co-edited with Esther Pardo. Thank you. Thank you, Anne, for the introduction. And thank, uh, thanks also to the organizers. I'm really grateful, uh, in, in fact, for being in this uh, conference and this panel, and I'll do my best to contribute to, to the general discussion with this uh, humble uh, communication. Um, Ekphrasis is an interpretative and creative process by which a piece of art is described through words or simply put, the verbal representation of visual representation. It belongs to an old tradition of exchanges between art and poetry, famously exemplified by the rich and recreation of Achilles' heel, shield in Book 18 of the Iliad, that extends to modernism and postmodernism, including the late poetry of both William Carlos Williams, mostly in pictures from Bruegel, um, 1962, and Denise Levitov, chiefly in a door in the hive, 1989. And my communication today will focus on tracing the confluences between Williams and Levitov, analyzing and comparing several of their extracts ekphrastic poems in this mentioned volumes, namely Levitov's A Good Cut and the sculpture homage to Chigida and Williams's uh, Children's Games. Poems, paintings and sculptures are different media products and as such they function as extensions of mind in human communication, as exchanges between the producer's mind and the receiver's mind. In an approach to public poetry uh, listenings, um, in 1965, poet Denise Levitov asked herself what makes poetry speak to the collective and why it is appealing to people, especially when read aloud. I'm, um, I'm quote, I quote him, um, I'm talking about the all that is readily available or could be to most people, the bringing into play of sensuous apprehension as a means of receiving the poem, either along with the rational intelligence or in some cases as a way through to it. The great majority of good poems can be apprehended intellectually as well as emphatically and sensuously, but when the faculties work together and divide it, that is when we bring more of ourselves to the poem, the poem will yield more of itself." End quote. Levitov's words echo the perception of poetry as an exchange between producer and receiver, being the latter an active participant in the reception of the poem, which becomes an, an intellectual and sensorial experience. For Levitov, poetry's appeal to its audiences is not only the subject matter it presents, the content, but what she calls the incarnation of content in form in this uh, same essay. I'm interested in analyzing Levitov and Williams's ekphrastic poems as incarnations of content in form, nuancing the notion of incarnation through the relationship between the visual, iconic, and the verbal. Um, Lars Elström has recently described iconicity as a, and I quote, semiotic notion that comprises creation of meaning based on resemblance. That is not good news, but uh, uh, where other semiotic approaches just refer to the visual, Elström refers to the creation of meaning based on resemblance between the signifier and the signified entities, regardless of whether these entities are visual, such as an image or a drawing, auditory, like a sound that mimics uh, what it represents, or even cognitive, where the resemblance is in the conceptual realm, as in metaphors. Elstrom's ideas on iconicity touch upon various aspects of semiotics and how humans derive meaning from signs and symbols. Re regarding visual iconicity and poetry, Elstrom expands on terms such as Carmina figurata, you notice poems resembling the visual shape of the objects they describe, such as uh, George Herbert's uh, 
um, Easter Wings or Vicente Huidobro's Helicoptero, and concrete poetry, that is um, typographically arranged poetry from the 20th century, that seldom looks like actual objects, rather it tends to form more abstract shapes that can be either regular or irregular, whether very simple or highly complex. And this would be the example, uh, the third example, uh, with E.E. E. Cummings' uh, Grasshopper. Um, Ellestron contemplates visual iconicity in examples that do not fit into these categories of what has been loosely defined as visual poetry. For him, visual iconicity is present in all kinds of poetry and is part of iconicity generated by all sensory modes and cognitive structures. While a painting and a sculpture possess a higher level of visual iconicity, a poem also shows iconic traits such as length of lines, stanzaic divisions, repetitions, or metaphors, which are obviously meaningful in terms of perception and interpretation of the content. Bear with me a bit, I'll get to the analysis of the, of the poems. In the act of seeing, um, the original artwork, the poem, and the artwork and the delight of the poem become fundamental in all these poetic artistic ex exchanges. As John Berger famously explained in Ways of Seeing, 1972, the acts of seeing comes before words, and every image embodies a different way of seeing. To look, and I quote, to look is an act of choice. As a result of this act, what we see is brought within our reach. To touch something is to situate oneself in relation to it. We never look at just one thing. We are always looking at the relation between things and ourselves. For Berger, uh, seeing is creative. Uh, the seeing and seeing art is fraught with synesthetic transfers. Seeing is touching something, closing a gap between seeing and words. The approach may apply to both arts and poetry's iconic content. What are Levitov and Williams' ways of seeing art, and what do they offer to readers' ways of seeing art and their poetry? Um, I tr I'm trying to analyze how the iconography of the artwork is transferred to the visual iconicity of the poem, so as to determine how this incarnation into form works at a stylistic level, how meaning is created in these transfers, and what do these ecrastic, uh, ecrastic poems reveal about the poet's uh, way, uh, ways of seeing art. In a good cut, uh, Levator tries to close the gap that, according to John Berger, is always present between seeing and words in her rendering of uh, the Angel shows St. John the New Jerusalem from the Apocalypse series by French artist Jean Duvet. Uh, Duvet was inspired uh, by a previous engraving by Albert Durer, sorry for my absent German. Uh, the Apocalypse, the Angel showing St. John the New Jerusalem, 1948, uh, sorry, uh, 1498. Uh, the, the apocalypse becoming a popular subject towards the end of that century when it was believed that the world would end. Uh, while Dugak only represents the saint once and focuses instead of ange on angelic figures, Jean Duvet re repeats the image of Saint John, recreating several moments in his as ascension to New Jerusalem. Uh, where Duve shows simultaneity, a, panopti a panopticon of still images within the frame of a single engraving, Levitov offers a narrative thread, a sequence uniting the different things in the good part, as we will see. In the first case, the sequence is not explicit, so I'm referring to Goodcut. It is the eye of the viewer that perceives a sequence of events through the juxtaposed repetition of the angel and of the saint, recognizable by his external traits and attributes in different positions and with different backgrounds. So the viewer, through their imagination, can follow the viewer, the figure, sorry, in the two-dimensional space of the good cut. The verticality of the stream um, on the right emphasizes the upward motion of the saint. In the second case, the poet establishes a narrative of the events, creating movement through the use of verbs of action. The angel leads St. John, who is rose, then rides and walks, reaches New Jerusalem, kneels, and gazes back at the angel. The poem creates a narrative threat interpreting the action evoked in the woodcut. Um, in the different scenes in the engraving, uh, 
the different scenes in the grain bin become a single thread in a poem through enjambment as well, which emphasizes the sense of movement and continuation between scenes. Such movement is not even interrupted by abrupt pauses, punctuation being reduced to a couple of commas in a final period. The only pause in the poem is the break between the two stanzas. Uh, the first stanza describes the events in the lower part of Dubé's uh, good cut, then records the saints' ascension to New Jerusalem and describes the surroundings. The second stanza describes the action of the saint in the celestial city, also separated in a good cut by a line of clouds. Multiple acts of seeing in the painting by means of verbs, verbs of repetition, the verb to gaze is repeated twice, uh, we have also the verb to scan, evoke the seeing of the poetic voice and add up to the sense of movement suggested also through the multiple directions of the sense of the saint's gaze, upward, outward, downward, inward. Um, the poem ends with a perplexing and even humorous note. Whereas the notebook that the saint was carrying in his two previous representations, is he perhaps looking for it to record the glory that he contemplates to no avail? Or perhaps he has discarded it in his hurried ascension. Um, a good cut might look descriptive, but the iconic incarnation creates a sense of movement that animates the hieratic images, giving them agency and even adding a sense of inconclusiveness to this uh, story. Um, I'm moving to the sculpture, homage to Chigida. Um, Levertov, uh, uh, this, uh, this is uh, um, the work of art that is mentioned in this poem. I'll show you the poem in a second. Levertov didn't contemplate directly Chigida's works, to my knowledge. According to her biographer, Donna Hollenberg, she wrote a poem in 1988 during a visit to the Austrian Tyrol. The poem and I quote, emerged unexpectedly from the notes that she took the previous fall while watching Rainer Moritz's television film about the Spanish sculpture. Then the sculpture Homas to Chigida is an example of mediated expresses, where the poet doesn't render the sculpture's work directly, but rather Moritz's audiovisual rendering of multiple works, as well as his own reflections on art and sculpture. There is an allusion to a specific artwork, though, which is this one, the Windcomb 1976, a set of three large sculptures located where the land meets the sea in Ondarreta Beach near San Sebastian. The Windcomb summarizes Chigida's approach to sculpture as a way to capture the empty spaces between his forms. He called himself an architect of emptiness, a builder of gaps. Levitov's poem shows certain degree of visual iconicity precisely by replicating spaces and angles, and I have tried to underline those here. Um, the composition plays with sharp angles and gaps, such as the ones in the second and third stanzas, creating right angles with lines, angles that also appears, appear textually. Um, I'm quoting from the poem, who learns from his shadow the arcane power of right angles. Um, in addition, different anaphoras, a man who, a man who, or who learns, who permits, to acknowledge, to the wind, to pour, and rhymes, uh, power and flower, compresses and tresses, as well as several parallelisms, a man who lives with his shadow, who learns from his shadow, a man who transmutes, who permits a stone, um, creates a sense of symmetry, uh, that echoes at a rhetorical and cognitive, uh, and cognitive level the iconicity of the angular symmetry evoked by Chigida's works. Also, as Hollenberg uh, highlights, and I quote, Chigida's comments about the relationship between a sculptured form and inner psychic, uh, psychic space is analogous to Levitov's reflections about the relationship between a speech and silence that the poet addresses into Rilke, which opens the collection A Door in the Hive, and also find their way, in their way into their poem with the allusion to his role Chigida's role as a sculpture who permits a stone to acknowledge the inward void it compresses. Um, the poem shows a turn between stanza four and five. In the first part, stanzas one to four celebrate Chigida as art maker and his art process. Then the second, stanzas the five to six, reflects on the wind calm and its interplay with the seawater and the wind. In the first part, monosyllabic and disyllabic words predominate 
creating a constant, quite repetitive rhythm that, that combined with the already mentioned anaphoras and repetitions echoes the strokes in a forge, especially when the poetic voice describes the transformation of iron in the third stanza. In the second section, length of lines varies and showed us the rhythm, the last stanza enacting as a crescendo, um, enacting a crescendo. There is a sense of ascension in the last stanza in visual terms as lines grew longer and longer, but also in terms of contents with new gestures lifted to the wind, new spouts for the water called by the wind to pour itself into, into a leap from shouting. These new gestures are the different sculptures with ascend like spouts where the water and the wind uh, play and shout. All natural elements, fire, stone, wind, water, are present in the poem, and the, the sculpture is in charge of giving them shape by transmuting or combing them. The sculpture is the agent of the metamorphosis of matter, or mass, as I mentioned in the poem, into art, a figure imbued with an arcane power, a force of nature who teaches a stone their inner void. But his resulting sculptures are also fused with nature, with nature themselves, partaking of the same metamorphosis and movement the artist becomes the illustrator of the metamorphic processes that are already present in nature, in the same way that the poet is the witness of Chijida's artistic process and pays homage to him by illustrating such metamorphoses of organic forms. Now, moving on to Williams, finally. Um, children's Games in 1560. Uh, is an oil on panel by Flemish Renaissance artist Peter Bruegel, the elder, and the entire composition is a catalogue of um, over 200 children playing at least 80 different games. Although there are adults represented, most of the city has been overtaken by children's games. Bruegel's intention behind this painting remains ambiguous. It is unclear whether he wanted to represent life in all its richest details or to compose an allegory of the foolishness of human beings. What Williams might have found appealing in this painter is, is or this painting is, is this ambiguity, since he never separated the high from the low, the spiritual from the everyday. Then this creative ambiguity shows a similar way of looking at things in both poets and painter. At first sight, Williams's poem shows little, little visual iconicity. Nothing in its, in its aspects on the page reminds us on, of the content in the painting. What is evident in the visual aspect of the poem is the recognizable three-line stanza, Williams's variable foot, although non-stepped. In an interview, Williams explained that the three-line arrangement allowed him to get rid of the redundancies of the line and to make the poem go faster. A speed and concession are undoubtedly conveyed with the three-line stanza, but his choice is also compl complemented by his ideas on painting and poetry, as discussed in an interview with Walter Sutton. And I quote, the design of the painting and of the poem I've attempted to fuse. I don't care whether it's representational or not, but to give a design, a design in the poem and a design in the picture should make them more or less the same thing, end quote. Since the design of the poem is carefully crafted, La Mise en Page becomes very revealing too. So the printed page is a poetic unit, as Marjorie Perloff um, stated. The three-line stanza design is in fact iconic in the sense in this sense, it is a visual design, almost a visual brand through which we recognize Williams's poetry. Um, such uh, recognition adds a layer of transparency to his poetry since readers see quickly a familiar form then proceed to read focusing on, on the content. And this is related to the Sri Lanka stance as a container of meaning that uh, Professor Rodriguez Herrera, Jose Manuel Rodriguez Herrera was mentioning this morning. But what about the incarnation of content in the poem? What is Williams's interpretation of the vast array of Bruegel's children's games? At first, the poetic voice uh, describes larger details in the painting, such as the schoolyard, the village, or the stream. Um, 
To move on to the description of groups, uh, he refers to uh, children, some boys, elderly women, and also games like this uh, play wedding and the christening. The second section starts with more players and their games, while the third lacks uh, references to specific children, focusing instead on toys and other objects. Williams does not try to encompass every single game, like Bruegel, but rather to give a searching focus, creating a sense of direction out of the carefully arranged chaos in the original, where everything is represented almost at the same level and there's no focus on specific figures or spaces. The focus is created through the division into sections, through the identification of characters by singling down scenes and searching details. Bruegel's design lacks a narrative or even a center. He rather aims at creating a decentered totality. Williams abstains from replicating such totality, but he mirrors such the centering quality. Everything is motion, reminds us the fourth stanza, that everything is the painting, but also the poem. And the motion is a wandering eye that goes from the general to the specific, the centering the painting through the description of little scenes and details without imposing a narrative. Bruegel saw it all, says the poetic voice, mentioning the painter for the first time, implying that the poet, the spectator's gaze, cannot replicate such gaze. Bruegel's grim humor, and therefore his gaze, is replaced by Williams's wandering and compassionate gaze. Um, uh, very quick con uh, conclusion, um, iconicity that is semiotic resemblance based on visual, cognitive or auditory aspects as understood by Elastrom is present at different levels in these three ekphrastic poems. Uh, Levitov shows a higher level of visual iconicity in the sculpture with the inclusion of angles and spaces in the composition echoing Chijida's most renowned sculptures, but also examples of auditory iconicity evoked uh, evoking the sound of the forge. In a good card, Levitov describes St. John's ascension to New Jerusalem in narrative terms, creating an upward sequence. In both poems, we find, we find a poetics of ascension and metamorphosis. Williams, on the other hand, also evokes motion, but his is a motion without a narrative threat, but rather singling down sing different scenes and details and unifying his little scenes through the use of the three-line stanza and the continuous enjambment, capturing and highlighting fragments taken from the otherwise chaotic milieu. Both poets use enjambment to emphasize a sense of continuation and unity. Uh, the incarnation of content into form, of course, differ, uh, differs, but their aim is not all-encompassing, and above all, they humanize the different artworks, artworks through their gaze by establishing an intimate but non-imposing dialogue with them. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Maria. Thanks to all of our, our presenters. And um, I think that was a wonderfully rich and, and surprisingly interconnected panel as well. So um, I hope there will be interesting questions from the audience. We do have some time. There are questions. You know, it always takes a while for the questions yeah. to come. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, Alberto. Well, thank you all for your amazing presentations. Um, my question is maybe like for all of you, but taking into consideration, I was, as I was thinking while I was listening to Esther Sanchez Pardo's presentation, um, but also connected to the other um, analysis and um, even the, the correspondence, the letters and um, the visual, uh, the connection between the visual and the poem, um, this idea of... Um, as in, we've seen Williams and Levitov and many poets trying to use poetry um, to kind of like build an like an eternal text for for everyone to read. Um, so this idea of 
death, uh, in the elegy, in the end, um, stays alive uh, forever in the written text. So I don't know if you would like to say something about this. It's more kind of like an appreciation rather than a question. Thank you, Alberto. Um, okay. Eternality only exists probably in art. Okay. And you are pointing us, of course, in the right direction. When we go to class, you go to class, we go to class, we speak about these people who are more alive than ever before. So this is very true. And I think that uh, something that makes um, total sense to me in my practice as a reader, teacher, okay, is um, also to raise the question first to me about modalities of existence or modes of existence. Because, yeah, I believe that the, rea the realm of art is um, another realm. Uh, and of course has not much to do with um, everyday existence, but these modes of existence um, to me um, are important example. Um, the way um, poetry and other things like narratives exist um, today as um, with the digital, more shareable. And for example, I was thinking before, well, we have, I'm sure we have been thinking about many issues I, we were unable to raise here, uh, many. Um, I was thinking at the beginning of um, using this, um, um, I was working on the elegy, of course. This is my, my thing present, one of the things at present. And uh, I, I went straight to the elegies and the poems that have been produced by the Black Lives Matter movement. Okay, uh, okay, mm, bringing back to bringing back to life or the legacy of these um, abs absurd deaths and, of course, uh, unfair deaths. The kind of existence that this realm allows us to enter, interact with, I think it makes, makes a lot of sense. The zombie, the zombie text, how do we unbury or uncover texts that were haunting us but were hidden from view and re-emerge? due to a specific historical social circumstance. I'm thinking of modalities of existence. Ours finishes when we are 85, okay? And this is it. And the rest is literature and art. But the modalities of existence as they matter, okay, as um, all my colleagues, but certainly uh, doctor, uh, these modalities that are questioned from the real, the um, using theory, you know, the kinds of in, in interaction with other discourses as uh, Dr. Uh, Luis Martinez Victorio was um, drawing attention to, um, speaking about the non-entity and the objectification make me think a lot totally about these modalities of existence. Uh, decent existence, burial and forgetfulness, re-emerging of the thing, re-emerging of um, cadaver texts, um, you know. So we know 85 is, okay, this is for humans, but the rest is another realm. And we work with that, and this is what makes us understand existence as not a thing that is totally discontinuous. There is something fragmentary in us, there is this gap, there is these angles that Dr. Porra Sanchez was, these angles and the emptiness within us, within the work of art. But the modalities are what matters more to me and this is um, 
So my first, thank you. Um, other questions? Yeah, Ellen. Thank you. Thank you so much for these amazing uh, papers. And I really lo love how many of them uh, really centered on uh, common themes, all of them really, but this idea of the image and, and art and making art. But but one, my question, uh, at the risk of making a fool of myself, but Mark, did you say that some of the letters were marked unsent and that they were still in the archive? Like along the lines of commemorating, preserving, why, why are they, do you have any thoughts on like, because if I were a poet and I have many unsent letters, but I, I think I wouldn't archive them. What, what are your thoughts on this? Well, a group of letters, he didn't send them and he re, he, he wrote something similar, but less pointed. I think he understood his, uh, what, what's the word I want for him? Because actually Ammons and Levertov are both very much alike and they have very strong, uh, commitments and, and values around, uh, poetry. And, and so they, they, there's a sense of restraint. Uh, and, and so I think that in part explains it. Why, why it's in the archive. I, I, I can't answer that part other than I'm assuming that he turned everything over and they're there. Um, he didn't, you know, there were no instructions in terms of withholding them. I've talked to Kevin McGurk, who's gone through them uh, pretty carefully, but, um, uh, yeah, it's an interesting question. I, Chris can speak to this, but yeah. you know, th there, there's so much to learn from these from these exchanges. I, I just um, this letter goes on. The one that I'm quoting from, 1962. Um, it's um, you know it's like four single spaced pages, um, and and um, on the other hand, I guess I should say Levertov. Uh, she sent James McLaughlin's letter in which he says. I can't publish this person. He's too preoccupied with his own head, essentially, right? He's more interested in him listening to himself thinking. And I think Laughlin fundamentally misunderstands him. But at the time, the literary values I think that he was working with uh, didn't allow him to see what Ammons was up to. And, and subsequently, people have been able to discern that. But um, anyway. I think it's amazing that Levertov manages to navigate, like Duncan, Ammons, Williams. She really covers a lot of ground uh, in her affiliations. It's it's astonishing to me. Yeah, 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 yeah. I agree. <laughs> well, I was just thinking uh, with Chris too, like what is the status of an unsent letter, um, and what is its place? Is it like a journal entry? What would you say as an editor of letters, if you, if I? Hmm. Yeah. Well, I, I think if I'd found any unsent letters in editing Williams and Levitoff's correspondence, I'd have put them in the book <laughs> if she didn't mind, if she was still alive to give an opinion. Otherwise, if the publisher didn't mind, I'd have put it in because it's very useful to see what wasn't sent because it tells you something about what was and what the relationship was. Also, they can be drafts. I was thinking of yeah. Marcia Nardi's unsent letters. Mm. Um, the, the ones that Williams put into Patterson, she, uh, she wrote several versions of before she actually sent it uh, because she, they were very carefully crafted. And she's a wonderful letter writer, but in part that's because she spent so much time on them because she was very concerned with the particular effect that she wanted to make upon him. So um, mm. they're, they're very um, interesting and useful. I don't remember if Elizabeth O'Neill, no, she didn't put in any unsent letters in her. She published the whole correspondence between Williams and Marcinardi. But those drafts are at, are at um, University of Texas, Austin, and very interesting to see. They're not marked unsent sometimes, so some scholars have mistaken them for sent letters, mm. leading to unreliable scholarship. <laughs> I'm going to leave it there. 
Yeah, and I should clarify that that Kevin McGurk, in his he he, he published a um, a collection of Ammons's journals uh, and letters before 1972 when he published his book Blank Poem Sphere, which which is a sort of turning point in Ammons's work, and he includes the unsent letters in that published volume, as well as in the Chicago Review that I mentioned, those letters are excerpted and the unsent letters are included. So they, they are out there. They're not just in the archive. Yeah. Um, very interesting. We did start a little late. So um, with the permission of the organizers, we can probably have one more question. If you want. Maybe even two. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, thanks so much for the for, uh, presentation. That was really amazing. Thank you very much. I want to uh, I want to ask uh, Sanchez Pardo, Professor Sanchez Pardo, about uh, yeah that that fact about um, image as the image in the poem as a as, the, as a lost object. Um, so I think that. In English literature, in particular, loss as exile, or if, perhaps in modernism, more, 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 in particular, uh, exile is is a main uh, a main issue. And uh, the elegy on the lost objects. Uh, so you have mentioned uh, Freud's uh, uh, morning and melancholia. Uh, so the basic distinction is if if it, this is not correct, please uh, tell me so. Is that loss must be so sorry, uh, mourning is due to a conscious loss, while melancholy is due to an unconscious loss, right? And um, so I have a little outline here. Uh, so sorry, yes. So after that unconscious loss, what what when we enter so, the so-called depressive position, there is this next step called the reparation process. So we are trying to get back to the to the object, and. Um, and as you as you put it in in, in your lecture, um, could that could that uh, it lost object in the in the poem as the symbol of the poems uh, be due to that um, to that reparation process or that sort of condensation of of meaning due to uh, to that paranoia that is created through the reparation process? And also, I think that. The process of creating a poem is basically the same as that of reading it. So we're trying to see in the symbol, in the image, whatever that we may like, because we have this sort of idea of the lost object and we're trying to get back to it. So we have this sort of creative paranoia in our minds uh, to get out of the symbol whatever we may like. Uh, I don't know. So my question is... Um, do you think that uh, poetry implies uh, the creation of poetry implies melancholy? Thank you. I think that too many things. Yeah. From an inquisitive mind like yours. Sorry. And an inquisitive mind like many of us. Okay. Too many things. We need to unpack them. I I believe not right now, but gradually, okay, gradually, too many things. You're condensing too many things, I, I believe. If it implies melancholia, okay, let me let me uh, first um, say that I don't quite read, uh, <laughs> I've been a, an ancient reader of uh, Freud, uh, many, many things. Um, I won't say that the conscious loss is on the part of first to start, on the part of mourning and the unconscious. I won't, I won't, because melancholia is a stage, let's call it a stage, that is produced after there is something that gets prolonged in time and uh, makes or produces a malfunctioning in the subject. Okay. Um, we are speaking of the fantasy world. The fantasy world is that of literature, is that of creation, and you were speaking of this creative paranoia and whether the uh, poetry implies melancholia. No, I won't say that. I would say 
if we go to specific cases, okay. So um, we need to go, I won't say it all produces or it, or it I won't specific case, and you know, we share some of the language we are using at this point. I'm fascinated like you are, I believe, by lost objects. Mm -hmm. uh, many of them are irrecuperable and we mess around and play around with all these gadgets, the literary, the sculptural world, um, to fill in the void of that irretrievable thing. Uh, that's how I see literary, artistic, um, cultural production. Uh, yeah, but I won't say that uh, melancholia or poetry comes out of melancholia. Um, maybe you're thinking of your other time of your recent in the Renaissance and the idea of uh, initial idea and how it produces many things. I, I won't subscribe, but thank you. It's very it's fascinating to speak of oh, the yes. lost object all the time because it seems to me that we are. Okay, thanks. Um, I think there's discussion to continue over lunch. <laughs> um, thanks, everybody, um, presenters, uh, especially. Oh, sorry, I, said, oh, I yes. want to say something before yeah. we go. Oh, I'm very sorry. Yeah, please. If that's okay, I'm taking over as the organizer here. <laughs> um, look, I want to say thank you um, to all the members of this panel. It has been a great panel, and I have enjoyed it very much. But before we go, before we have a lunch break, I want to say thank you wholeheartedly from my heart, from myself and Jose. Thank you to Esther. We are co-organizers, but the organizer is Professor Sanchez Pardo. She has been hosting us so warmly. So heartedly, yes, uh, so kindly. And I know that she won't be able to be with us later today. And I just want to, to express this in public. Um, both Jose and I have been helping her, but she has been the one sorting everything out here in Madrid. We are not in Madrid, you know this. She has been the one organizing all the logistics, the preparation of the whole thing. We have been helping her through email and, you know, um, and sharing. But we want to say thank you to you. Even though you are not um, in a position to, uh, to admit it, we have to say that. This is very unfair because... <laughs> Thank you very much. This is very unfair because you worked very hard. Um, we have been a team and the thing is that I have an urgent circumstance which is not uh, melancholic. Let's put it this way, it's more on the happy side that has to do with this motherly thing that some of us experience at some point in our lives. That makes me live. I We've been a team. Jose is fantastic and Christina is unique. And I am following them in this little path. I must say thank you to the very distinguished, distinguished um, people who are here, have accompanied us. Professor Long, um, uh, Dr. Sheck, Professor McGowan, Professor Han, Dr. Adler, Unique, each and every of any of all of you, you know, all unique. It has been really a pleasure. I thank you wholeheartedly, Dr. Sheck, for her work in 
helping us very much uh, making this into the open through your very kindly and very generously through the William Carlos Williams Association. And uh, I believe that this is only the start of another very, very challenging, pleasant path to our next maybe meeting. Maybe it's going to be digital. Who knows? Maybe it can be on the screen. But I believe that this is an opening, a clearing in the forest that, um, you know, is, is just the beginning. has been a real honor, okay, a real honor uh, and learning from you. We'll have the chance to follow thanks to Borja Ormazabal, Adrián García Vidal, who should be able to follow this when it is properly edited and available. And um, we invite everybody to join us digitally or at some point and get together because has been too intense and maybe condensed in so little time, but so impressively important to the three of us at least and to the group, I believe. Thank you. Thank you.